would you describe the, the tolerance in Islam? So, what I was saying to you before is that uh, the idea of tolerance is, is not actually an Islamic idea um, in the sense of uh, society because if you look at uh, tolerance, the term tolerance, it's, it, it carries negative connotations. Um, medically speaking, if you speak uh, to a medical doctor about what tolerance means for the human body, it's usually associated with something like pain. So you have pain in your leg and you can't get rid of it, so you, you tolerate it. Um, we use it in neuroscience, in pain research. We speak about pain uh, tolerance and um, whether your tolerance goes up or down and sensitivity to pain. So it's, it's not necessarily a good term to use when, it's, when you speak about, um, about Islam. Um, from an Islamic precept, we have more of a, an embracing of differences um, if you look at the Quran or the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there was not a tolerance, it was an embracing of difference. And that actually is a hallmark of in, intellect. Um, our fa faculty of intelligence, which makes us different from other animals, is not exercised by having similarity, by having things that are similar to everybody else. Um, in fact, if it's exercised in any way, that it would be the most minimal type of exercising of, int of intelligence. Look at the bonobo monkeys, which are the closest animal relatives, if you will, from an evolutionary perspective to us. What makes us different from bonobo monkeys, which have, on a behavioral scale, a lot of similarities to human beings? The thing that makes us different is intell intellect. And our intellect is only exercised when we're faced with difference. That's how you know... Um, your beliefs and your own opinions. If your opinions are congruent with everybody else's and your beliefs are exactly the same as everyone else's, chances are you never actually exercise your intellect to come up to those conclusions. You're just mimicking and copying everybody else around you. So it's, um, it's uh, having differences is one of the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says it in the Quran that had he wanted, he would have made everybody exactly the same. And difference is something that he willed to have in the world. And difference is something that is part of the free will that we have. Um, when Allah says, amanata, You know, when we have given, we have, this, you know, we offered the trust. But the mountains, the heavens, they all denied it. They didn't want to hold it. And, الإنسان, and human beings carried it. Differences are a sign of us having free will, which is a sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God has given us. And when we read the Quran, what do you feel when you're, when you're uh, going through the verses? And it, calling them verses in English is actually a bad translation. Ayah is a sign. And when we read the signs of God in the Quran, going through each verse, we experience elation, we experience, uh, we feel good, we, we get revelations from it and inspirations. Um, it strikes us, it makes us think. It, I mean, it does a lot of positive things to us when we read the signs of God in the Quran. For some reason, a lot of us though, when it comes to the world and it comes to each other, we want to reject those signs. We don't want people to be different from us. It, in a sense, it's a psychological defense mechanism. We want to be self-assured about our beliefs and when we are faced with a challenge of difference, the way that most people respond to it is by being um, antithetical to it. They don't want it. Um, but if you want to speak from an pr Islamic principle, you know, starting off from Islam rather than starting off from Muslims, because we have to differentiate between the two. From an Islamic precept, we don't have tolerance. We have embrace. We want to keep everybody in. We want to. We want people to be different. It's it's signs of the beauty of the world. I mean, if you look at a painting, um, paintings are beautiful because of the contrast they offer. If you look at us, uh, uh, you know, a poster or a painting that is just white or black or red, and it's just one color. You would just look at it and pass on. You wouldn't even care to spend much time on it. Oh, look at this color red. It's all red and it's amazing how red it is. And that's not what you think about. We are always attracted to things that offer lots of contrast. And in fact, if you look at how your brain works, and this is something from neuroscience, the way our visual field works and the way we identify things is not through uh, looking at constants in the environment. It's always through change. So when you're driving, for example, um, you don't keep track of everything on the road that is still. Your eyes catch things that move, and that's how you avoid accidents. 
so that you can look at them and examine them and, and know how to basically maneuver and do it. This is how your brain functions. So whenever you look at uh, a group that wants to, you know, make everybody a monolith, you know, everybody's exactly the same, know that that group is not thinking anymore. And that's actually one of the signs of group think. Um, Nietzsche said something very interesting about this. Uh, he said that uh, insanity is rare amongst individuals, but when it comes to groups, it's the norm. So it's it's yeah. something to think about, you know. Yeah. It's always a reason for someone who's almost not very close to God to, you know, to, to choose to be an atheist. So how could I deal with something like that? Um, I find mockery and, and ridicule very interesting because it's, it's used as a rhetorical tool um, quite often in the West. And um, people think it's just uh, in the West. If you look at uh, uh, even our own history amongst uh, Muslim societies. We have Abu al-Ala al-Ma'arri, for example, or uh, Abu Bakr Muhammad al-Razi, who's, uh, he, was, uh, he was an atheist. Abu Ala al-Ma'arri, he's the one that says, Ya ummatun dhahikat min jahliha al-umamu. Aghayatu al-dini, um, how did he finish that? Uh, something about liha, like you know, is this the is this the religion? The religion is just all all nation who every all, all nations have laughed from, is the end of religion just uh, lengthening your beards? Is that what religion is to you? Um, Abu Bakr al Razi was making fun of uh, religion and he was ridiculing it, mocking it, talking about prophets being schizophrenics. I mean, we have that even in our own Islamic history, people like that that arose. And Abu Bakr al-Razi is one of the greatest pharmacists and chemists that have been produced by the Persians and, in fact, by the world. So it's not something that's new. It's used as a tool to show how ridiculous a position is. However, when you look at insult and mockery, according to, the, 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 to just definitions, look at the definition of the word, the word itself in the dictionary. It talks about arrogating oneself and thinking of oneself as higher than the other. So you have to adopt a position of pride first. And in order for you to adopt this position of pride, you have to think of yourself as better than everyone else. That your intellect has reached something that everybody else has not, and then you ridicule them. So it's, uh, it's a position of superiority, self-declared superiority over others, and then you start mocking other people. Now, the mocked, the way they respond is, either in reaction with retribution and retaliation, or they end up feeling some inferiority complex about themselves. They get taken in by the mockery, and then they want to regain their superiority, or at least regain their, um, they want to gain a superiority or regain their equal status, their equal footing with the other person who has asserted a superiority over them. Not thinking about the specific circumstances of how did that person even get superior to me? How did they get that impression? And how, did, how come they're making me feel inferior all of a sudden? It has nothing to do with the argument. It has nothing to do with the religion per se and everything to do with the ego of the other individual. If you're weak personally, you know, if your psychology is weak, you will either fall for it and end up trying to gain equal footing by adopting their uh, ideology or... If you have some strength to you, but you're a dogmatist and you're not someone who thinks about it, you'll end up responding with an abrasive response. So this idea of mockery is really interesting. And um, Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayah just uh, sent out a tweet earlier this morning. Um, in it, he says, لا تشتم. You know, don't insult. Everybody can insult. Anybody can make a mockery of anything. It doesn't, it's not enlightening to mock someone. And he said, yeah. rather say something that can contribute to the, con to the conversation that no one else can say. And in it, he's trying to tell you that you have something else to offer. Insult is really the, the, the tool of someone who has nothing else to say. As soon as you start using mockery and you can't face an argument with an argument, that should just be a red flag for everybody to say, hey, maybe this person actually has nothing to say and this is all they have. 
You've mocked me. You're not showing how ridiculous a position is. You're just showing how good you are at ridiculing a position. So I, I, I find it problematic that a lot of people go uh, with mockery as, uh, you know, they go into the Oscar Wilde type of uh, uh, perception of it and conception of it, that it's a tool to, uh, to, that shows your high, your high intellect. It's not, really. It shows that you're not engaging with the argument. You're just uh, playing child childish games. You know, when kids in the playground talk about, nah, 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 like, okay. That's really what mockery is. If you want to mock something, you should mock mockery itself. Because that's what children do on the playground. It's not what intellectual people do in an uh, intellectual academic setting. And if you look at a lot of, actually, if you look at a lot of uh, the treatments in academic journals that talk about the new atheism, because that's really what uh, new atheists talk about. If you look at old atheist works, something like by David Hume, it was, it was, it's very engaging, you know, inquiry into human understanding, inquiry into religious understanding. I mean, his treatment of it was very erudite. I mean, that was a person who actually thought about things and tried to engage in it with it in an academic way. Look at new modern atheists. That's not what they do. They just sit there, mock, and they do something like what Richard Dawkins does with uh, science, you know, Richard Dawkins' argument for science boils down to his statement about it. It works, bitches. Get with it. That's what he says about it. Uh, that's not an argument. So, yeah, it's. Uh, I just wish that people would uh, be psychologically stronger. And, uh, you know, when they see someone who's mocking, really treat that behavior for what it is. Childish behavior that if you're uh, in a setting with parents, I mean, what do kids... When kids are playing around and, and doing uh, all kinds of things that uh, uh, that are not uh, that are just childish, what parents do during that circumstance is literally ignore it. They just go like, "Oh, it's just the kids being kids. Don't worry about it." Yeah. Oh, that's a very good answer. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we are to say that the roots of atheism are starting to go in Egypt. And we're probably in our way to Europe and uh, America and whatever. Yeah. So how could I deal with that? I mean, this... you know, I, I don't know if, the, if, you know, violence or whatever has yeah. hand in this. But I, I just want to know how could I deal with that, you know? Um, there is a... Uh... The the reason, as far as I can tell, just, you know, from my initial um, feelings about it right now, um, the rise of atheism, not in just Egypt, but in the modern, in, in the Muslim world in general. And Egypt is not the leader in this. It's actually Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia has the largest uh, underground no, atheist. Yeah, weird. this is, really yeah, weird. yeah, Saudi Arabia has a large, it's actually the leader for uh, really atheism weird. in the Muslim world right now. And if you know the dynamic of, I mean, Saudi Arabia is not undergoing a political, you know, upheaval and a revolution or anything. But if you, yeah. I lived in Saudi Arabia, I've been to Saudi Arabia, I know how the culture there with regards to beliefs, religion, in, intellectual inquiry, um, it's very suppressive when it comes to that. Now, there is something called the Flynn Effect I don't know if you're familiar with it. Um, James yeah. Flynn, he's a, an American moral philosopher. And he brought attention to this to the uh, to the American Association of uh, Psychology Psychology Association, um, and the Flynn effect is that with every generation, there is a a three point increase in IQ. Okay, so every generation actually gets more intelligent when you measure it on an IQ you know standardized intelligent quotient scales. Um, if you look at uh, someone from, uh, and I think the number that he mentioned, if you bring someone from the 1900s and you ask them uh, and you put them to t and you test them based on our modern uh, understandings of, uh, of intelligence, just test them on modern uh, scales of intelligence, they will score around 70 on the IQ scale. And if you bring us and you test us, someone from the modern time, 
to the 1900s and test them on the same on their scales on their uh, perceptions you'll you will get a score of 130 so based on their standards we would score 130 on the intelligent quotient scale which is genius okay yes, of course. and if you scale them if you bring someone from 1900s to now and ask them and i'm talking about average people here not like big scholars or anything just average people and you ask them based on our scales they will score 70 which is actually borderline retarded that's like that's a scale for i mean my my research in uh, neuroscience is on fragile x syndrome 70 is like someone barely managing to work at a cashier till you know and just get themselves around so what is going on what's going on is um we have a rise and if you look at um and this is a kind of a, a negative externality of uh, media ever since the beginning of islamic history um we had what's called the qassasin people who just tell stories they sit at the masjid al wa'ath you know they sit at the masjid they talk to the crowds and they move they move them emotionally and they get everybody to cry ali ibn abi talib radiyallahu anhu he um, he banned them from the masjid and he used to beat them because they used to manipulate the crowd emotionally and he was very concerned about that um, Ahmed ibn Hanbal was uh, sitting That's in... one of the most saddest things in Egypt. You know, this is something that is very, very, very common. Yeah, and Ahmed ibn Hanbal was... Yeah. He went to a masjid and because he heard about this guy that was just... And I can't remember his name, but he was also a famous, famous figure. And he moved over. And this guy was as ignorant as you can get them. I mean, this guy didn't know anything about Islam. Yet he was... Moving the crowd emotionally, people were feeling spiritually, quote unquote, spiritually elated, more like when it's really more like emotionally driven. And um, he would sit there and one time he would talk, and Haddathani Ahmed ibn Hanbal, you know, Ahmed ibn Hanbal told me this. And Ahmed ibn Hanbal is sitting in the crowd and he covered his face because he didn't want people to, um, uh, to know that he was there. Uh, the reason for that is if they saw Ahmed ibn Hanbal attending this guy's lessons, then that would give credence to this guy. So Ahmed ibn Hanbal just wanted to hear him first. Ahmed ibn Hanbal even got moved. He was emotional. But then at the end of the lesson, he goes up to the guy and he says to him, So where did you hear this hadith? And he said, Haddathani Ahmed ibn Hanbal. I heard it from Ahmed ibn Hanbal. Now, Ahmed ibn Hanbal says, um, I'm Ahmed ibn Hanbal. And I never saw you in my life. <laughs> How did you hear this from me? Now, the guy, though, he looks at him and he says, now I know that you are stupid. And Ahmed ibn Hanbal was confused by this. Like, what? What do you mean? He says, do you think Allah would create just one Ahmed ibn Hanbal? This is how he got around it. That, oh, you're not the only Ahmed ibn Hanbal on the planet. There's other Ahmed ibn Hanbals. Which is, I mean, if you look at it, it's ridiculous. But um, the crowd, and this is something that Ibn Rushd actually in, um, uh, in his... Uh, uh, Fasl al-Maqal, he's got a book called Fasl al-Maqal bain al-Shari'ati wal hikmati min al-Ittisal Basically the, the, the final statement on the connection between Shari'a and Hikmah He's talking about uh, uh, wisdom that, uh, the, and the intellect And in it he talks about the division of the crowd The crowd is, uh, you have, uh, the crowd can be divided generally into three types of people The majority of the crowd can be moved and really mostly moved by emotional rhetoric. Just sit there and tell them stories and make them feel good about themselves. And, and that's all they need. They don't need arguments. They don't need anything like that. The second group, which is less now, is the argumentative grouped, group. This group likes to argue, likes to discuss. The, they like to have, to, to have a, a more of an intellectual discussion. And they speak about logical fallacies and they want to know about what intellectuals said about this and that. And that's what they like to do. And this is more of an elite type of group, intellectually, academically. And they're less so than the, that what you see in the, in, the, in the majority. And then the highest that he talks about, which is the very few people, he says those are people that have surpassed the emotional rhetoric. They have surpassed the argumentative rhetoric. And they basically see, they have insight now. They see truth for what it is without need for arguments. Now, that group, and if you look at, and this is something to do with language. I mean, what is language? Language is, uh, is not about words that you produce with your lips and, and tongue. That's not what language is. 
language is a uh, is a, a tool to communicate thoughts that's what it is and this is something that we we have more evidence for in neuroscience than uh, anything else i mean it's language is something that is just communicating thoughts and you can do it with your words you can do it with your sign language you know american sign language for the deaf they communicate in the same way that we can communicate it's just they they use their hands as opposed and face and facial expressions as opposed to using words with your lips and tongue okay so that's what language is. It's about communicating thought. And Ibn Rushd is talking about the highest group as a group that sees the thought for what it is. They don't need the words anymore to, to describe it because words will always have a limitation. Okay? So when it comes, to, you know, just to take you full circle back, what is the issue with the rise of atheism? The rise of atheism is because the media has promoted wa'af. Okay? It has promoted people that when you really investigate and probe them as much as you can you will find that from a scholarly perspective from an academic perspective they are actually not very scholarly they're very good at using their emotional rhetoric and anybody that can see through emotions that is more interested in the argument will look at that and say well if that's what religion is then religion is false and the way that we promote scholarship in our Muslim world, for example, is not by contribution to, scholar, to scholarship. It's by positions. So, you know, and by memorization. So you look at someone and they go, okay, who's this? al Alam al fahama Badru al-Zaman, Hujjatul Islam. You know, and okay, so how is this person a Alama and a Fahama and a great scholar? And what did he do? If you look at in the West, how do they gauge... What is, who's the most, um, who's the, the, the biggest intellect in the Western world? If you were to think of one name, who would you think of? Can you think of a person? Um, no, I don't know. Okay, so I think the magazine is called Prospect Magazine, and it's a, it's a British magazine, and they did a survey, and they asked people in the Western world, who is the, the most intellect, who's the greatest intellect right now in the world? Noam Chomsky got number one. How did, how did Noam Chomsky get number one? What is Noam Chomsky's contribution? Is it by his MIT association that he's a professor at MIT for the last 60 years or whatever? That's not how he got it. Noam Chomsky is the highest cited person in the academic world, period. No one has as many citations. I mean, if you look at most into academic works, Noam Chomsky is the most cited person, and he's cited in linguistics, he's cited in cognitive science, he's cited in neuroscience, he's cited in politics, he's cited in everything. His merit, his academic merit, is through his contribution to scholarly works. The way that we do it, though, in the Muslim world, is what? This person memorized the Quran and all the hadith and all the scholarly works and he's a mujtahid in the madhab and mujtahid in the madhab doesn't mean that he is someone who comes up with new opinions. It just means that he's so, like the way we understand it now. It just means that he's someone who can cite to you what scholar X and Y and Z has said about such a matter and uh, he holds this position in this committee and he's a professor at this and that. But when you go and probe, okay, what is his contribution to academia? What did this person contribute? Nothing. This is how we gauge it. This is how we gauge scholarly works. And that person gets put on TV channels. And so when you ask that person, can you tell me such and such? And can you explain to me what is the issue with this and that? They actually can't. If you ask them to produce their own thing, they can't. And this is a product of what? Our way of doing scholar scholarship. You, if you study with a, with a traditional scholar today, unfortunately, with the majority of the famous ones, the way they train you is through intimidation. Okay, so they get you to memorize what everybody else has said before you. And when you try to come up with your own explanation that is based on the same tools that the previous scholars used. I mean, the previous scholars uh, did not... They were, they were brilliant because they were using the tools of Arabic language and the tools of logic and they were looking at the Quran and probing it without fear and they were coming up with their, you know, their conclusions and what we've done is we didn't do their methodology, we just took their conclusions. Now, if we go back to this issue of IQ going up every generation by three points and looking at 1900 versus now, 
going up from 70 to 130. And you have people today that are considered in the Muslim world as the highest allama fahama this and that being asked questions and the only thing they can produce to you are conclusions of people from medieval times, 500 years ago. Not regarding acts of worship, but regarding matters of philosophy, matters of science, matters of thought, you know, things like that. Matters of mu'amalat, uh, you know, social transactions, politics. And the only thing they produce for you is what the scholars of medieval times have given you. You, as an individual of modern times, who has actually elevated in Ibn Rushd's uh, categorization of the population, you're not a ammi anymore. You know, the majority of population has progressed and, pro and elevated academically, and now we're all thinkers. You know, a lot of us are thinkers. A lot of us are wanting to listen to the argument now. We're not interested in the emotional stuff. And the highest scholar is someone who's using emotional stuff with you. If that's religion to them, what's going to end up happening? You're going to end up rejecting religion anymore uh, at the end of the day because they're not offering you anything that will satisfy you intellectually anymore. And this goes back to something that uh, uh, a lot of uh, traditional scholars and uh, traditional students of knowledge, they're holding on to something that uh, someone like Imam al Nawawi, um, I don't know if you heard of Imam al Nawawi, but he's one of the, you know, he's the final mujtahid in uh, the Shafi'i school, for example, uh, that adjusted the Shafi'i madhab. Imam al Nawawi, he has a, a little treatise called Adab al, -al, -al Mufti wal Mustafti. It's about the manners of fatwa and, uh, and uh, the one giving fatwa and the one receiving fatwa. And in it, he talks about the responsibility of the scholar giving the fatwa to the, to the person asking for the fatwa. And in it, he talks about al-awam. And in Arabic, and the word ammi comes from amma, you're blind. So if you're going to talk to someone who is not blind and treat them as if they're blind, they're, number one, going to be insulted by you. Because you're assuming something about them that they have lost, they, they don't have a faculty that they actually have. And secondly, you're going to pretend that there are all of these things that they don't need to worry about. But they do need to worry about it because they can see. Now, Imam al says in it that when it comes to uh, giving fatwa, you're not, you know, in his uh, treatise, he says don't give them all the differences in opinion and just leave them like that. You need to do tarjih. You need to give them the sound opinion according to your understanding, because they are a people who can't think for themselves, and you need to do the thinking for them. Basically, that's the gist of his uh, the treaties. That might have been valid for people back then, you know, 700 years ago, when illiteracy was rampant, when people did not have access to Google and all kinds of works. One of the revolutions of humankind that has taken place is literacy. Literacy rates skyrocket. The thing that comes with literacy, you know, the ability to read and write, is that now a lot of people have access to scholarly works that the previous people did not have access to. So if you're going to pretend that the person in front of you asking you all these questions can't just go and with a simple click of a button find the book that you're talking about and read it and find other books and read them and find contradictions in what you're saying and then you're saying that this is Islam, I mean... It's not surprising. When I see guys, and we have, I've seen a lot of Muslims who left Islam, and I engage with them quite often. And when I listen to what they have to say, always, it always goes back to this. And it's because people that they're talking to are not humble enough to say, listen, this is what I understand. This is what my conclusions so far from my readings, this is what I've come to. No, this is what Islam says. Islam says, this is how we give credence to our own opinions, you know, and we make our own relative experience absolute for everyone else. And so when presented with this option and someone is telling you this is Islam and you find something else, you go, okay, then I guess I'm not a Muslim anymore because I, to be true to my own intellect, to be true to my own rational powers, to be honest with myself and be able to live with myself, I cannot live with myself if I have a contradiction like this and I can't reconcile it. So you know what? You can have your Islam and I will just leave it now. This is how they're thinking, and it's totally understandable. It's totally understandable. And the way that Islam is being understood that, hey, this is this one religion, Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah, and Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah, if you look at, even, even within Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah, forget about the other groups, just this one group alone, we're always being subjected to a single interpretation by like six or seven people. 
you know, forget all the other hundreds and thousands of scholars that have come through the tradition that have disagreed, that have given alternative options. No, 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 no. It's this one option. We need to make the ummah united through uniformity. And if you don't want to, uh, uh, you know, subscribe to our uniformity, then you might as well leave us because you're going to cause us a weakness. And, you know, you'll be a hypocrite amongst us. So we just need to get rid of you. And this is the way they approach it. So, yeah, why not leave Islam? If that's how Islam is being presented, don't be surprised. And the Prophet Sallallahu did say that لا تقوم الساعة حتى لا يقال على الأرض الله الله You know, the hour is not going to come until nobody on earth even says Allah. The, the, even the name of God is not even mentioned. Let alone to say لا إله إلا الله. No, they won't even mention God anymore. Well, how is it going to happen? This is the process. I mean, if you observe it, this is exactly what's going on. It's a progression towards complete and utter atheism. And this atheism has a, an underpinning, an undertone also of anti-theism. It's not just an indifference towards religion and God. It's now anti. They want to get rid of it and completely just obliterate it. And they're going to succeed simply because... I mean, we have the prophecy of the Prophet Sallallahu but the reason they're going to succeed is because of us. Imam al-Ghazali said that in the nisf al-kufri fi al-alam yahmil wizrahu mutadayinuna baghadu Allah ila ibadi. Half of disbelief is carried by those people. I explained a lot. You know, you know, um, at some point, yeah, I mean, you remember when we were talking about Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, you know, I've always asked myself, what if they were right and I am wrong? Yeah. Yeah, and then I just thought maybe this is real religion, and maybe we're we're do we just we we don't want to admit. So that's exactly what know. you know what this know. is exactly what, what um, uh, Sam Harris for example he wrote a Sam Harris is one of the you know the four horsemen of new atheism as, as he's called for in uh, the West here. Um, Sam Harris said. And he, in a blog uh, uh, post that he posted on his website, that uh, he, in his response to people attacking him and his colleagues for their uh, fundamentalist atheism, and he says, we're not fundamentalists. Uh, the only thing we're doing is taking religious claims seriously. We're taking religion seriously. And so when you do, do it in the way that he's doing it, yeah, you'll come up with, if you do it with religious people, not religion, if you do it with religious people, you'll come up with this madness that you see right now in Egypt, for example. You know, and you have the previous Mufti, Sheikh Ali Jum'a, coming in and, and promoting the political party of whoever. And then you have this other guy, Madhar Shaheen, who knows where he came from. I mean, I've never, this guy just popped up out of nowhere. And he's talking about, you know, let's vilify the Muslim Brotherhood. Then the Muslim Brotherhood, you try to like see their side, but then they do things that make you go like, okay, like I'm trying to help you out here, but now you're using religion again. And during their time when they were in power, Basim Yusuf, when he's uh, criticizing them, I mean, a lot of people did not like what he was doing. And in fact, he did kind of, you know, he did a lot of work to help out the, the revolution. Yeah. Most of the youth are trying to do this right now. You know, they're trying to to help them, and in the meantime, you know, when you find, you know, there there's this contradiction in the you know, you you see you see you know the the wrong from both sides. You yeah. just tell yourself that like they they might be they might be the victims. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. I don't know. It's uh, the the way that uh, religion is. Uh, I, people talk about Islamic reformation, right? You know, we need to reform. We need to reform Islam. We need before we reform Islam and talk about reforming and doing all this, we need to first really examine our own Muslim community and how we are uh, thinking about things. How. You know what? I don't. I'm from the position that says that Islam is not in need of. Uh, reformation because it has all the tools and all the necessary attributes for it to be valid for our modern time okay the the people that need to be reformed are muslims the way that we approach islam the way that we understand religion the way that we understand each other the way we understand our role in the world all of that has to be reformed islam itself in its essence it's fine it's completely fine it doesn't need i mean if you the more you delve into it the more you go like uh, you see a disconnect. And to be honest with you, um, I personally, even though I study and I do all these things, not a day goes by 
except that I'm always tested. My Islam is always tested. Not by Islam, but by Muslims. I'm always being tested by Muslims. I go like, what religion is this? <laughs> right? But I, I, to be true to myself, I, my intellectual conclusions, my belief, all of that stuff, I know that Islam is true. It's, so I always have to consciously reject Muslim conception of Islam and continue to go forward. But I really get it. I really do get it. I can see why all of these young Muslims are just saying, like, forget this religion. <laughs> like, I want to be enlightened now. Um, you know, stereotyping and, um, you know, misusage of, um, of religion. Yeah. So, um, we, we just make things out of nowhere and we say this is religion. So, where should I take my religion from? I mean, should I only read Quran and pray and so on? Or should I do, what should I do? I mean, now it's not easy to ask anyone. Yeah. At all. It's you know... Not, something you know you know there's a lot of madhahibs and there's a lot of uh, you know misconceptions and so on so we just say whatever we say something that the, you know we, we get things out of the air and we just say this is religion so how can i as someone who doesn't know anything especially that we didn't learn very well in schools how can i learn religion easily um <clears throat> So okay, this is this touches on a on a the problem of uh, Islamic miseducation. Yeah, um, that's a terrible thing in Egypt. Though. Yeah. So the the problem if you if you studied uh, basic, I'm not even asking you to be to become a scholar, but if you studied basic texts um, in aqidah and in fiqh, just basic ones, stuff that. I mean, right now, for example, people study Risalat ibn Abi Zayd al-Qayrawani, okay? And in the Risala, <clears throat> which is a, it's a Maliki premier, okay, for the Maliki school of fiqh, um, Imam uh, Abu Zayd al uh, ibn Abi Zayd, Abu Muhammad ibn Abi Zayd al-Qayrawani, he talks about uh, uh, why he wrote this treatise, okay? And he says... Because he's responding to someone that asked him, and Imam ibn Abi Zayd at the time, it's, it's noted that when he wrote this text, he was about 30, 31, something like that, years old at the time. And he says to the person who asked him to write it on fiqh and aqidah and whatnot, he said, سألتني أن أكتب لك جملة مختصرة من واجب أمور الديانة. Now, he says that uh, you asked me to write you just a summary of the things that are obligatory with regards to religion, okay? And uh, that, uh, what you would say, what you would believe and whatnot. And you asked me to do this based on the school of Imam Malik. But then he ends that paragraph by saying, لِمَا رَغِبْتَ فِيهِ مِنْ تَعْلِيمِ ذَلِكَ للولدان. You did this, you asked me to do this because you wanted to teach children. You're not asking to teach scholars and you're not, you're just looking to teach little kids about Islam, Okay. This text of Ibn Abi Zayd, I have, uh, for example, here uh, the copy of Dar al-Fikr. And this text goes to about 153 pages. This text right now is being taught at the university level to people that want to become muftis. On their path, you know, just before they finish this text and then they study uh, Mukhtasar Khalil in Maliki school. Al-Mukhtasar Khalil, Khalil ibn Ahmed al-Misri, he was an Egyptian man. He was a, a, in the army at the time when he wrote it. And he was 26 years old. That text of his is being taught literally to people that are going to be quda, jurists. Now you're going to be like a Maliki, Faqih, Mufti, this and that. This guy was 26 when he wrote that. This should tell you the situation, why we're in the situation that we're in right now. Um, when you study basic texts, the first thing that they, you would be able to distinguish is the difference between what is something related to aqidah, theology, belief, what makes you a Muslim, and what is related to fiqh. You know, just acts, you know, just doing your law, Islamic law. And then within Islamic law, you're being taught, okay, what relates to ibadat, 
to act of worship and then what relates to mu'amalat just you know social and business transactions and how to conduct these things and then as you study just basic texts we were talking about you're going to be told what is essential part of the religion and what is just an ancillary just a side issue whether you do it or not or how you do it is you know it's it's fine to do it this way or that way you would actually be trained to know okay this this is what i should do and this is what i shouldn't do once you get that sorted out and you go through a basic text right now if you do it with somebody for you know a couple months a lot of things will become clear for you you're like okay wow i had no idea that this guy on tv is talking about all these things and they're just non-incidental issues that we shouldn't even bother talking about because they don't matter. You know, they matter in the big scheme of things within Islamic law, but to make it something as part of the religion that you're going to hell if you reject this or that or whatever. I mean, look at the text of Aqidah. The hadith, I don't know if you've heard of what hadith Jibril is. It's one of the most famous hadiths in, Islamic, uh, in the Islamic tradition. When Jibreel alayhi salam comes and as a, in the form of a man and he asks the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, akhbirni an al-Islam, akhbirni an al-Iman, akhbirni an al-Ihsan. And the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam tells him, al-Islamu an tashhada an la ilaha illallah wa Muhammadur Rasulullah, taqim al-salat, tuti zakat, tsum al-madha, tahajj al-bayt in al-salatay li sabila. You know the five pillars of Islam. And then he says, akhbirni an al-Iman. What is Iman? He says, Al-Iman billahi wa malaikatihi wa kutubihi wa rusulihi wa liyawm al-akhar wa al-akhar al-akhar wa qadari khayrihi wa sharrihi. Six pillars of faith. That's all you need. Now progress. Go through and see what the scholars did afterwards. The scholars started writing treatises on aqidah. Okay? On creed. The creed in Hadith Jibreel is just the six pillars that the Messenger Wasallam said. Believe in Allah and the angels and the Messenger. That's all he said. The scholars came afterwards and started adding to it their elaborations. You know, this necessitates this and this necessitates that. And you end up with texts of aqidah that go up to 200 lines of poetry. And then the scholars will tell you, if you don't believe in this, then you are, you know, a zindiq, you're a heretic, or you're going to hell, or you're not part of Ahlul Sunnah, or you're this and that. We started coming up, you know, uh, the Quran says, "Wama khtalaf al-ladin utu al-kitaba illa min baghi ma jaahum al-ilmu baghi yam bainahum." That the people of the book, Allah is telling us, you know, and whenever you read the Quran, and this is another problem, you know, the way we read the Quran has always been, look at what the Jews and the Christians did, look at the Jews and the Christians, look at the Jews. Allah is telling you, take an example of what they did, because you will fall into the same pit hole. When the Messenger وسلم, says, قبلكم, You will follow in the way of the people of the past. Shibran bi shibr, dira'an bi dira'. You know, an, an inch by inch and an arm span by an arm span. Hatta law dakhalu juhra dabbin, la dakhaltumuhu wa ra'ahum. That even if they go into a lizard's hole, you'll go exactly into the same lizard hole, just like they did. You know, a lot of uh, the wa'ath, the people who go on TV, what do they talk about? Oh, you're doing your haircut with a fade. You're doing exactly like the kuffar. You want democracy, you're doing exactly like the kuffar. Like, this is, this is how they talk about it. But that's not what the Messenger وسلم, necessarily is talking about. Maybe that's one side of it, but that's not the important side of it. The important side of it is that Ahl al-Kitab, the people of the book before us, they got knowledge, and then they differed amongst each other, and they elaborated, and they came up with their own explanations, and they started to make halal what Allah did not make halal, and make haram what Allah did not make haram. And in doing so... They, they started oppressing one another and they started calling each other heretics. If you study the history of Christianity, for example, you'll be just like, just take the word Christian out and put in Muslim. It's exactly what Muslims are doing. This is the exact history of Christianity. We're doing exactly the same thing. And yes, the Messenger says, uh, no, okay, go ahead, go ahead. Keep, keep going. Yeah, the Messenger said that uh, uh, in the verse, uh, you know, Suhaib al-Rumi, he was saying that, uh, uh, oh, Messenger of Allah, we did not, when we were Christians, we did not, we were not, worship, we were not taking our rabbis and our priests as gods before God. We're not, we didn't make them partners with God. And the Messenger of Allah says, uh, Did you make halal, what they made halal, and make haram, what they made haram? And he says, yeah. And he says, هذه ibadatuhum. Now, this is the worship that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about. This is how you worship them. So, when you look at how we're doing things with our scholars, and Allah in Surah An-Nahl, He says, لا تفتروا على الله الكذبة. 
بألسنتكم تقولون هذا حلال وهذا حرام لتفتروا على الله الكذبة You know, don't forge a lie against God with your own tongues claiming this is halal and this is haram and to forge a lie with your tongues against Allah. Verily, those who forge lies against Allah are, are the losers. You know, and so the way that we approach it, and if you look at the early scholars, Imam Ahmad, Imam Malik, Imam Abu Hanifa, they never said this is halal and this is haram except in things that were clearly stated in the Quran or in the Sunnah, undisputed. That's when they used that word. Otherwise, you know what they would say? They would say, هذا يعجبني أكره ذلك. Now, scholars after them came and said, when he says, هذا يعجبني, that means it's halal. And when he says, أكره ذلك, that's tahreem. That's, that's him saying it's haram. You didn't get into the guy's mind. He's trying to be pious and he's keeping in mind the verse in the Quran that says, لا تفتروا على الله الكذبة. And now you're forging a lie against that person so that he forges a lie against Allah. But all of this is stuff that you would learn from basic. Like, it's not even, you know, we give this air. How do you, when you think of a doctor or think of an engineer, what kind of respect do you give a doctor or an engineer with regards to their field? You relegate things to them. You ask them. You, you debate with them sometimes. You ask them questions. If they say something that doesn't make sense to you, you, you inquire about it. And they, they're expected to answer you. And you're not bound by the words of a doctor or an engineer. You know, they can't make you do something. But when we think of scholars in Islam, they have this haiba. You know, we talk, we talk about there is no clergy in Islam. You know, لا كهنوت في الإسلام. We say that all the time. But in reality, maybe we don't have a kahanut, you know. ما في عندنا بابا والقس ومش عارف. We don't have that. We don't have priests and things like that. That's true. Officially, we don't. But unofficially, we do. We do have a clergy in Islam. And look at your own psychological, emotional reaction when you hear the Sheikh said. Yeah, the Sheikh, as far as in Islamic scholarship, the, the status of a scholar in Islam and scholar of medicine when it comes to the field of study itself should be equal. Yeah, he's a person who's getting you to God. He is trying to get you to perfect your relationship with Allah and whatnot. But the way that we have uh, elevated their status so much to the point of giving them infallibility, you know, Isma and the Sheikh said, Khalas uskut, don't talk. The Sheikh said, the Sheikh said, the Sheikh said. It's messed up. Ibn Hazm al Zahiri uh, from And al Andalusi. Ibn Hazm uh, was from the, it's called the literal school, but it's. It should be more translated like, it's not literal, but the apparent, because he went with the apparent of the text. Ibn Hazm, during his time, some of the scholars say that uh, when he came about, because he tried to study the Shafi'i school, the Maliki school, and eventually he became independent, and he said, forget this, I'm not going to go with any of the schools. And the reason he rejected the schools was because every time he would ask them something, they would say, well, the scholar Fulan said, Sheikh Fulan said, Imam Fulan said, Al-Allama Al-Fahama, Al-Bahra Al-Allama. He said this and that. Taqiyya al-Din, Muhyya al-Din, Fulan al-Fulani that does this to the religion. He said such and such. And during his time, the scholars focused more on what scholars said than what Allah and his messenger said. And so he came up and he started basically rejecting all of it. And it forced the Maliki scholars in his area because uh, Al-Andalus was a Maliki area. It forced them to re-examine a lot of things. And to go back to the text and to provide the proofs and to show why we say certain things. Not because the scholar said it, but because Allah and His Messenger said such and such. And this is how you can understand it. How, to get back to your question, who do I listen to? How do I get... You need to basically find somebody. And uh, the way you do this, honestly, uh, you know, first of all, you have to ask Allah to guide you to somebody to, yeah. that, will, that will respect your intellect. And not treat you like a child. Because the way that you would teach a child is different. I mean, sometimes I sit down with children and I teach them something. And to a child, I noticed something. I had uh, kids ask me, they came to the masjid and I was asked to give them a little bit of a presentation. They were grade five kids, you know, eight, nine years old. And they asked me about like, so why don't you eat pork? And I said, why, what do you guys think? And we're talking about eight, nine years old. And they started yeah. saying, oh, is it because it's dirty? Is it because it's not a good source of meat? And their parents were there as well. They were trying to give up, come up with kind of like explanations. 
And then I said to them, the reason we don't eat pork is because God said don't eat pork in the Quran. You know what the kids did? They didn't argue. They said, oh, that makes sense. God said don't eat it, so just don't eat it. They were satisfied with that answer. Now, if I go and tell that to a university student, will he be satisfied with that answer? He will not. I guarantee you, he will not be satisfied with God said so. I need to understand. Why can't you eat pork? You have to get into a much deeper discussion with that person. So the first thing that you have to look for, as far as I can see, with a scholar, if the scholar is suffi uh, suffices himself with telling you, God said, so just shut up and do it. That's a sign that that's a person you shouldn't really be listening to. When it comes to your matters of religion. Yeah, at the, ultimately, ultimately, God said. I know God said. I, that's not what I'm, I'm looking for you to satisfy my intellectual curiosity. I'm looking for you to show me, you know, if someone tells you God said and just and they stop at that, a lot of times you will find that they're actually only privy to one opinion or one interpretation of what God said. There is something about the Quran called al-Dilal uh, al-Qat'iyya wa dilal al You know, it's something that is clear cut. You know, لا تقتلوا أنفسكم. You know, don't kill yourselves. I mean, there are some clear cut verses that don't require. Uh, uh, these are clear-cut verses talking about killing a soul unjustly is like killing all humanity. You don't need multiple opinions about this. But there are other verses that have what's called Dilala Ghaniya. They could they're open to interpretations. And you have to find somebody that is Okay, so this is another issue. Um, the interpretation of the Quran has to be, and and this is this actually touches on on uh, postmodernism. Postmodernism is uh, is uh, high. Uh, the what is the telltale sign of postmodernism is relativism. It's about my truth is my truth, your truth is your truth. There is nothing absolute anymore, and that actually negates any absolute meanings, which basically makes the text meaningless if you say it's all relative then the text itself becomes meaningless because at the end of the day you're deciding for yourself what is right and what is wrong and to do so would be just going to an extreme on the other hand if you're saying everything that person is saying is absolute and it all revolves around them you're basically saying they are possessing they're possessors of truth when in fact you should be more it's more accurate to say i belong to the truth but i don't possess all of the truth now, when it comes to the interpretation, it's not necessarily about the expert. It's about the tools of interpretation. So Allah says, That verily we have revealed this dhikr, this remembrance, and we are the ones who will preserve it. How, preserving it necessitates the tools of preservation to be preserved as well. So the Quran itself, the first thing that you go to, you know, if the Prophet ﷺ didn't say anything about the verses, which is most of the Quran, you know the hadiths that are known to be authentic and undisputed where the Messenger وسلم, talks about a verse, what it means, are very few. You can count them on your hands. Like They're not common. The majority of the Quran is left for it to reveal itself. And Ibn Umar who says that خير تفسير للقرآن الزمان The best tafsir of the Quran is time. Let the Quran unfold itself. But in letting it unfold itself, you still have to rely on particular tools of interpretation. The first one that you have to go back to is the Arabic. You cannot take a verse and then assume that you know what it means based on your understanding of Arabic, modern understanding of Arabic, which is flawed by most accounts. And then say this is what the verse means. The Quran was revealed in the Arabic of the time that it was revealed in. The Arabic of Quraysh. You have to go back to that Arabic. And that Arabic, classical Arabic, is still preserved to this day. And the way you know what a word means, you go back to the pre-Islamic poetry. And that's why in traditional societies, like you go to a place like Mauritania, for example, one of the first things that they teach children is not necessarily the Quran. They teach them the muallaqat, you know, the seven hanging poems, the odes that the Arabs used to have before Islam. Because they were the most eloquent things that they were... Pre the, yeah, this is pure Arabic. So if you go back to the Arabic, 
and then go, okay, this yeah. is what the verse is saying in Arabic. And then you look at the verse, Tafsir al Quran bil Quran. What does that verse? Because the Quran is, uh, the way you look at the Quran is like a circle. You know, at the end of the Quran, it says, At the end of that nas, there is a kasra. It's not a sukun. You're not supposed to stop. You say, Al-Nasi, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Like it's continuous, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alam. And you go back again to the beginning. And the way the Quran is ordered in, uh, in itself, it's not ordered in a chronological order. So the first verse on uh, allowing fighting, for example, comes in Surah Al-Hajj. Okay? But then the first verse in the Quran talks about fighting is in Surah Al-Baqarah. Okay, so if you look at it chronologically, it's not going to fit. You have to look at the Quran as a circular thing that you go to it as a whole. So if you want to understand what a verse means, you have to go back to the Quran and go like, okay, so what, what else does the Quran have to say about this particular matter that it's talking about? I'll give you an example. And this is something that a lot of people just, you know, across Islamic history debated and, and started calling other people non-Muslims for and whatnot. And this deals with the issue of, do you see Allah on Yawm Al-Qiyamah or not? Will we see Allah in heaven? Ahl sunnah say, yes, we will. Everybody else, Abadiyya, Mu'tazila, Shia, everybody else says, no, we won't. Now, you'll have Sunnis that will say all of them are kuffar because they're rejecting the Quran that way. Well, how? Can you explain to me, good sir, how are they rejecting the Quran? Allah says in Surah Al-Qiyamah, وُجُوهٌ يَوْمَئِذٍ نَاظِرَةٌ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهَا نَاظِرَةٌ Okay, faces on that day are illuminated, gazing upon its Lord, Nadira. So okay, you want to tell me that all of these people, Shia, Abadiyya, Mu'tazil, all of them miss that verse, have nothing to say about that verse? Yeah, they do. They say Nadira, also in Arabic, comes from Nadira, which doesn't just mean look, it means to wait. Muntadira means because Allah is not a, a thing to look at. Allah is laysa kamithlihi shay. So in light of the Quran, we can't look at Allah because Allah is not like anything else. I mean, they come up with the, their explanations of it. Then you have linguists that will take the Quran and go like, okay, wait a minute. Allah says Nadira, the apparent of the verse says gazing. But what does Allah says about looking in the Quran? He uses two different words. In Surah Al-A'raf, he says, وَتَرَاهُمْ يَنظُرُونَ إِلَيْكَ وَهُمْ لَا يُبْصِرُونَ You see them looking at you, but they're not seeing you. Well, what does that mean? Oh, in Arabic, we have basar and nazar. Al-basar yufid al-idraq. Wal-nazar la yufid al-idraq. You can look at something, you know, and everybody has had this experience. You know when you see a, a friend sees you and they say, Hey, fulan, hey, Ahmad, hey, Ahmad. And Ahmad is looking at the person, he's not responding. And then all of a sudden, Ahmad clicks in and says, Oh, I didn't see you. No, you did see them. You just didn't comprehend them. You weren't, you weren't registering. I didn't register looking at you. When you're driving, you see a lot of things, but you don't register them. That's what nadar is. You don't comprehend these things. But basar is idrak. Absartuhu means I looked at him and I saw him and I saw him with my eyes and I comprehended him with my brain and I saw that. So Allah in wujuhun yawmaidhin nadira ila rabbiha nadira using the Quran to do tafsir of Quran, you will see that the word used does not mean comprehending Allah. Which means you will see Allah, but not with basar, not with idraq, not in the way that would make Allah like anything else. That's just going back to the Quran, looking at it. How do you arrive at these things? Do you arrive at them philosoph uh, with philosophy? Just philosoph uh, you know, philosophizing about it and think about it on your own? Or no, you have to go back to an absolute tool that you use to interpret the Quran. Look at all the verses on jihad, all the verses on fighting, which are very few. They're not a lot. They're very few verses. How do you govern the idea of fighting in Islam and military engagement? You always do it by going back to the Quran. If you take the Quran as a whole and use all the verses together, it will actually destroy all the ideology of people like Al-Qaeda and uh, Jabhat al-Nusra and all of these people in Syria, like if they take the Quran as a whole, it will not support their case. You know, Daesh, Dawla al-Islamiyah fil Iraq wa sham they all use cut out verses and they come up with their interpretations and it becomes relative and then it becomes what? Ijtihada. You know, he's just doing ijtihad. He's, he's coming up with his ability to interpret. But there are certain things that are not open to interpretation when you have all the interpretation tools given to you. And this is what I mean by Islam has all the tools for its own reformation. It doesn't need us to come and reform it. 
It needs us to reform our perspectives and our, uh, and our approach. But there's another issue, not just about the Quran. The issue comes to the scholars themselves and what the scholars have said. There is a work by uh, Douglas Hofstadter. He's a cognitive, uh, 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 he, he works on cognitive neuroscience and, and he's a, a psychologist. He, his book is called uh, Surfaces and Essences. And he basically, in this book, outlines his 40 years of research and thinking about how we think. And he basically boils it down to the way we think is through analogies. So we look at a situation in our mind. Sometimes we consciously do it. Sometimes we subconsciously do it. But the way our brain works is it creates an analogy. I see this situation. I, I compare it to something else that I know. And then I come up with the ruling for it. Okay. The scholars, and this is where modern scholars really have to come to grip with this. The scholars of medieval times had different realities. They were living in a different time. The analogies they were making were based on their context. Imam Malik, for example, and I, I heard this from a student who was at Azhar. I still haven't come across the, uh, the reference for it, but it's still uh, it's, it's true in its meaning. Imam Malik, when it comes to the issue of moon sighting, okay, when it comes to fiqh, he says that any two people that see the moon, the new moon, it obligates everyone on the planet, basically, to, to fast Ramadan or to break their fast for Eid. The understanding he had, though, at the time was that the earth was flat. You know, when we speak of the four corners of the earth, that statement itself assumes that the earth is flat. It has corners. The earth doesn't have corners. That ruling of Imam Malik was based on an understanding of empirical reality that we discovered to be false. Therefore, we do not use that ruling anymore. We go to another ruling that says, no, only if they share the day and the night, then it will obligate upon them. But someone like, I'm in Canada right now, you're all the way in Egypt, it's like 7 or 8 p.m. for you, it's 9.30 a.m. for me. It's a different time. So the, when I see the moon, you're not seeing the moon. So how can I obligate you to do something when you haven't seen the empirical evidence for it that you need to see in order for you to do it? So... This actually goes back to James Flynn's, uh, the Flynn effect with the IQ, the IQ going up. I don't see the IQ going up as people being more intelligent. The IQ going up is more about the way that they made analogies of the world. And it was based on their experience of the world, which was limited. It's not like our experience today. So the combination of our uh, uh you know, IQ going up and just uh, analogies changing because of our knowledge becoming more precise about a lot of things in the world, as well as the absolute tools such as the Arabic language and tafsir al-Quran bil-Quran and looking even at the hadith that is authentic and undisputed and whatnot. You have a combination of relative and absolute tools to come up with an authentic message that is Islam, where you do not negate the acts of worship and the things that we do to get closer to Allah through worship. But it allows us to evolve and to get with the time. You know, when it comes to politics, sociology, a lot of things have changed. There's a book called uh, The Empathic uh, Civilization. I can't remember the author's name. But the, in The, empath uh, the Empathic uh, Civilization, he talks about the evolution of society that took its way of identifying uh, its, uh, itself in relation to the other. And we began with, uh, through uh, our history, with just the family and then the tribe and then religious affiliation. And then we have the modern nation state affiliation. And he's proposing that we're actually moving towards a global empathic civilization because of the, uh, the economic and the media revolution that has taken place, where now I can connect with someone all the way in Egypt. Historically, 200 years ago, impossible. They, I mean, what's impossible has become possible. If you tell someone from 200 years ago that people are going to be go, go into a metal tube, okay, or an aluminum tube, and then they were going to elevate 10,000 feet up in the air and go across the globe in, within 24 hours, people would think you're insane back then. But that's exactly what we do today with airplanes. So it's, it's a very intensive work that a lot of Muslims... Uh, you know, we need to get into. And this is part, part of the program of someone like Dr. Tariq Ramadan is to get people of different specialties to come together in a consortium and come up with new answers to modern problems. Unfortunately, though, 
because of how we identify ourselves vis-a-vis -vis the other. You know, there is a, a verse in the Quran that talks about وَلَن تَرْضَ عَنْكَ الْيَهُودُ وَلَن نَصَارَ حَتَّى تَتَّبِعَ مِلَّتَهُمْ in الْبَقَرَةِ That verily the Jews and the Christians will not be pleased with you until you follow their way. The way that a, a lot of us understand this verse today though is if we come up to a conclusion that agrees with conclusions of Jews and Christians, the conclusion must be wrong because the Jews and Christians are doing that and they will be pleased with us. So we have to come up with something else. And so we don't seek truth anymore or authenticity from within our own selves. We seek it through negation. We seek it through conflict. We seek conflict and more than we seek reconciliation. We don't seek truth for truth's sake. We seek it for its difference. And this goes back to the very beginning when we talked about tolerance and talking about embrace. We, we don't want to be in a position of tolerance because we, we, we want to be, we seek tolerance. We don't want to embrace. We seek to be in pain. We don't want to be uh, having a reconciliation with anybody else. And so the verse is talking about us looking to get the pleasure of the other and telling us that you will not get it until you follow their ways completely. But it is not telling us that if you come up to a conclusion that they agree with, that you are necessarily seeking their pleasure. You're just seeking truth for truth's sake. You know what I mean? So uh, the way that we approach religion really has to change. We really have to change our perspectives. We have to think uh, in a different way about religion, about us, about ourselves, about the other. And we really need to look at the tradition for uh, pearls of wisdom, but not as a descriptive you know, the way we look at the tradition now, we look at it as a descriptive force. It should describe and dictate for us how to live. Well, if you look at, again, back to the Flynn effect, people that are literally half of the IQ that we have today and you want us to live like them, don't be surprised that a lot of us are going to leave Islam then. If that's what your vision of Islam is. I think I talked for a long time here. <laughs> Okay, uh, my next question. Um, how is an atheist not happy in your point of view? How is an atheist not happy? Yeah. Um, the only thing I can... Uh, yeah. I, to be honest with you, I, I don't know if, if I'm in a position to dictate and to state for the other. And this is another arrogant position that a lot of religious people put themselves in. That yeah. you're an atheist, you're not happy. I know a lot of atheists that are perfectly happy. I don't know about why their internal... Why do you think that? that why do you think they're, they're, I mean, they're, they're doing something that is totally against what God said that they should do? So why are they not happy? Because they don't want to be judged by God and they don't want to be judged by God. This is a question that always comes into a Muslim okay. mind. Okay, so how are they happy? Allah says in the Quran, وَكَذَلِكَ زَيَّنَّا لِكُلِّ أُمَّةٍ عَمَلَهُمْ we have beautified for every nation, every people, every group, their actions. And then he says uh, in another place, كُلُّ حِزْبٍ بِمَا لَدَيْهِمْ فَرِحُونَ That every sect with what they have, they're happy. An interesting thing about that verse, he says, فَرِحُونَ He doesn't say مُقْتَنِعُونَ <laughs> He says فرحانين. They're happy. Every group, whenever you associate yourself with a group, you'll be happy. But if you... Go as an individual and you want to be a free thinker, really like someone who's a quote-unquote free thinker. You don't want to associate with a group. You're seeking truth. You will never be happy. And that's the challenge. I mean, Allah says, وَلَا تَمُدَّنَّ مَا مَتَّعْنَا بِهِ أَزْوَاجًا مِّنْهُمْ Don't extend your sight, your gaze upon what we have made them enjoy. So someone who's doing what Allah has said not to do, I mean, this is again a, a simpleton understanding of religion that only Muslims are happy. I know a lot of Muslims that are just miserable and a lot of atheists that are completely happy. That's not how you gauge truth. Um, I saw this uh, movie, it's a Chinese movie, and I really recommend you guys watch this. Um, it's Confucius. It was released in 2010. And Confucius, and there's one with English subtitles. Confucius uh, was talking to the emperor of his uh, locality 
and he was giving him advice about how to get the three kingdoms and whatnot, and he followed him. But then when it came to the last kingdom, the king did not, the emperor did not want to go for it because it was risking his uh, political plan and risking his position, and he would he might actually lose everything. Now. Confucius, though, is focusing on the ethics of politics and the ethics of war and the ethics of all of these activities. And he's trying to give him advice from an ethical standpoint. He's trying to give him advice from an absolute standpoint. And the king basically shut him up in the movie and he says, why don't you listen to me sometimes? Just close your eyes and listen to me sometimes. Because politics at times has to be pragmatic. It's about what's useful. Not about absolute ethics. Just follow me in this time so that we can survive. It's about survival. Your own teacher would tell you that. And then it breaks into a scene where Confucius goes to his teacher in the sky, right? Because the Chinese have this tradition if you can still communicate with uh, your past teachers and get advice and whatnot. So his teacher is telling him, Confucius, you know, go with pragmatism right now. This is what's good for survival. You know, this is what will make you happy in a sense. And Confucius thinks about it and he says, no, I'm going to go with my ethics. I'm going to go with my absolute principles. And at that point, his teacher tells him, good for you, but know that you will be alone. You're going to walk on a path alone, be opposed by people. And it was after that, that Confucius actually ended up wandering the earth. He was kicked out in exile and he was miserable for the rest of his existence, basically, until he came back. So if, if you want to talk about who's happy and who's not happy... Never talk about the uh, religious affiliation of the person or non-religious affiliation. Talk about their uh, position with regards to principles. Are they going to be a person who will go against the group when needed to, uh, to uphold principles? Or are they just going to go with the group? If you are associating yourself with a group, you're going to be happy regardless of what religion or non religion you follow. But if you're someone who stands on principles, that's when you're going to have problems. I wrote this article on uh, you know and it's really interesting for the past couple of years that i've been writing people are happy you know i got all these people praising and oh Muhammad Ghailan is a balanced unbiased person he writes these things and he he's very rational this and that then i write something about the muslim reaction with regards to syria the so-called mujahideen that go to syria and use the quran and islam as uh, to give themselves credibility and yet at the same time you come up every couple of days in the news how they slaughter children and do the same thing that the syrian regime is doing yet muslims are not saying anything about it i write articles with regards to that going from the principle of just what does islamic ethics say about war jihad engagement and show that basically what these guys are doing is criminal and they're no longer mujahideen if they do these things they're criminals now I got all these attacks all of a sudden, became marginalized, got insulted, got mocked, got told this and that. I felt at the time, because I, I, I like to always focus on my feelings and how I think and try to focus on what's making me think in certain ways. And at the time, I felt this peer pressure, this bullying effect that at some point I would have thought that if I wasn't aware of it, I might give in and go like, okay, guys, you know what? There is jihad. They are doing jihad, but what they're doing is wrong. They shouldn't, you know, and start to basically appease the crowd so that what? I can be happy again. Because I became miserable for a good week over the response. And all of a sudden, the rational, unbiased, you know, Hamad Ghailan all of a sudden became what? Uh, An ignoramus who's uh, talking uh, secularism and he's being a westernizer and this and that. What happened? It's the same person, reasoning in the same way. I'm trying to go with principles that I believe to be true and they now disagree with your behavior. I'm not interested in the group. Look at the Quran. Every time, uh, uh, every prophet and every non-prophet that was upholding a truth in the Quran, it was always going against the group and they always ended up suffering either getting killed or being exiled or being persecuted or whatever. They always got attacked. So happiness is not, like I said, it's not, an atheist can be completely happy. And if you want to measure happiness, uh, I mean, in modern times, we have all these polls and statistics. We can no longer speak with this feel-good, you know, what I think subjective type of interpretation of the state of a person because they are not following exactly what I'm following. You look at the polls. The polls will tell you that atheists, like one of the happiest places on earth, I think, is Sweden, which has the highest atheist uh, 
a population. So that should uh, that should make you reflect. It's you want to be. Uh, I really have to stress this. If you want to focus on uh, truth, you really have to put your emotions aside. Mind you, though, emotions are not going to be completely excluded. You can be happy and be you know persecuted. What I'm saying is that don't use emotions as the sole criterion for determining what is true and what is not. Say that last one again. I I missed the question. Oh, okay. Well, after you know this religious fanaticism and so on. I yeah. Mean, um, how in your I mean in your point of view, how do you think I can clear all the dust that have covered, you know, the beauty of Islam? I mean, I as uh, person, as an individual. Well, I as an individual and us as a society, you know. Well. Um, the uh, this has to do with propaganda and and media. If you engage with a lot of Muslims and just talk to communities and just hang out with people, you will find Islam to be beautiful. Um, in fact, Tyrese Gibson, he's this uh, American singer and actor from. Uh, the Fast and the Furious franchise. Yeah. Uh, he was in Abu, in Abu Dhabi or Dubai yeah. filming for his, uh, his part in Dubai. And uh, he uh, made a video when he came back where he talked about how beautiful it was and how much love he experienced. And he was basically telling people, do not focus on the, uh, the media and what the media is saying because... Muslims are a beautiful people. I never felt as much love as I have <clears throat> and as much brotherhood as I have interacting with, this, with Muslims as I have with interacting with Muslims. So I think, and this is the difficulty. How do you avoid media when just about everything in your world is based on it now and how, how you get your information? I think what you're doing with the documentary is definitely the way to clear the dust. Right now on YouTube, there is... Um, an ad campaign that takes like three minutes long or something. Every time you watch a video, if you don't have an ad blocker, um, it pops up often. And it's about what jihad is. And it's Muslims that did a professional, nice professional ad. We really have to start perfecting our uh, our media engagement. And that's what I'm liking about a lot of uh, the Muslim-led activities on uh, media. They're putting out quality products that will challenge the status quo. And as an individual, that's basically you look at the skill set that you have and you apply it once you have a proper conception, you know, where you're not being treacherous to tradition. You're not negating Islam. You're, you're having a holistic understanding of it. And you just want to show the beauty of it. You, you, you show it through the ways that you, that you have available to you, whether it's through media, uh, through science, through writing, through whatever it is. And you really have to... Let your actions speak for themselves. Allah says in the Quran, "Woman, أحسن قولا ممن دعا إلى الله وعمل صالحا وقال إنني من المسلمين." Look at the order of actions that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala puts in this verse. Who is better in speech than the one who calls to God and does righteous works وعمل صالحا, and then eventually later on he says, "I'm a Muslim." That's like the the icing on the cake. You know, the cake tastes amazing. It's a beautiful cake. I love it. I love the taste of it. And then the icing is just, I'm a Muslim. So the way you do it as an individual is through your actions. And you really have to take some deep reflection and just focus on putting out quality stuff. As a society, we really have to get over our reactionary responses. We're always reacting. And that begins with the individual 
and then it will manifest in society. Look at, for example, the way that, uh, and there is a cartoon and it raised a storm. There is a, a caricature called Jesus and Mo. And uh, it's published by an atheist, a uh, couple of guys. And uh, in it, basically, they have a caricature of uh, Prophet Muhammad and a caricature of Jesus Christ. And in it, they have one of the episodes where uh, Mo is asking Jesus, what happened? And Jesus is watching the news. And he says, oh, an earthquake in this place and this many people died. Oh, a suicide bomber killed 20 people in Kabul. Oh, there's a drone that killed all these people in Yemen. And every time he tells him uh, bad news like this, Mo is saying, um, oh, that's too bad. Oh, that's so sad. Oh, that's too bad. And then finally, Jesus tells him, a bunch of people drew a caricature of you and insulted you. You know, insulting the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. All of a sudden, Mo, who was at the time playing video games, gets up and he says, in the, in, for Allah's sake, somebody do something. There is a satire in this, showing you the ridiculousness of how Muslims respond to things. We do not respond in, mag, in proper magnitude to events that happen around us. A lot of us are more willing to go up and raise a storm and kill people, even to that extent, for caricatures of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu But when it comes to injustice in the world, when it comes to people suffering in the world, what do we do? Oh, that's too bad. Let's go have dinner. So as a society, we have to raise awareness about these things and so we can give, you know, give every matter its due right. Don't go to extremes. And we've become an extreme community that is always reactionary, and it really, has, it really begins with the individual. And rather than thinking about, uh, you know, I, I heard this, you know, Will Smith, the American actor, he's yeah. got some, like, philosophy. Uh, yeah. his, his experience as a child, uh, when his dad told him to go build a wall in front of their store, a, ball, a, a wall was taken down, and his father told him and his younger brother, go build that wall. And Will Smith said that I didn't go out to build the wall. I laid down the brick. And every brick I laid down, I tried to lay it down as perfectly as I, anyone can lay a brick down. And that's what I focused on. I focused on that brick. And then I would do another brick and another brick. And then in a year, a year later, we came back and we looked and here's the wall. The wall was built. So the way that we should think about our community as Muslims is not necessarily as the community as a whole, but... Look at us as individuals and as families and our circle of influence. Always think of your circle of influence. Who can you influence with your actions? The way you react to certain events, the way you think about certain things, the way you display yourself, all of these things will have an impact on other people around you. And then they will change. And if you do not conform to negative stereotypes and whatnot, they will start to think in a different way. And then you... And then you top it up with what? المسلمين. Then you top it up with, look, you know, our religion teaches this, be like that, do that. You should try. And it takes time to build up. And we should not expect, a, uh, you know, a turn around overnight. This will take a long time for us to turn around. But it, it starts with the individual. And Allah says in the Quran, وَكَذَلِكَ نُوَلِّي بَعْضَ الظَّالِمِينَ بَعْضًا بِمَا كَانُوا يَكْسِبُونَ that like that we put tyrants over other tyrants based on what each one of them has been earning. You know, لا يغير الله ما بقوم حتى يغير ما بأنفسهم. That Allah does not change the, the condition of a people, of a community as a whole, until they change what's within themselves. So it starts with the individual and it will manifest itself in society. You want to see what the problem is in Egypt right now? Go look at the average Egyptian family and how they deal with each other. And you will see it clear how the father deals with the mother and with the children, how the mother deals with the children, how the family deals with the extended family members. I mean, that's how you look at it. And then you will see, okay, so this is our problem. Start with the family and then it, it builds up. Personal experience, you know, when I had, you know, this confusion in Israel. 
I, I just would like to ask you, you know, a couple of uh, questions, you know, uh, as a personal question. Um, uh, well, a lot of people assume that, you know, Jews and Christians are going to hell. So, I, I don't know. I sometimes feel like that doesn't make any sense because, you know, I feel like there are spiritual uh, Christians and maybe they don't know something about Islam and that's why they're not Muslims or they don't believe in Islam. So is it really they are going to hell? I don't know where I'm going. <laughs> Therefore, I can't talk about what anybody else is doing. But I can tell you this, that Allah, Subhan Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells, tells us in the Quran clearly what the criteria for his punishment is. And he says, وَلَا تَجْعَلُوا لِلَّهِ أَنْدَادًا وَأَنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ you know, do not associate partners with God. And then he qualifies it. He doesn't leave it as absolute like that. He says, knowingly. While you know doing that, don't do that knowingly. So judgment, according to the Quran, is based on knowledge. It's not based on apparent, uh, apparent manifested whatever belief that you have. Now, to say to come to terms with that is very difficult because... I have a sense that for a lot of us, the reason we want people to go to hell is because we are miserable in our religion. Yeah. That's why. I mean, look at... Uh, and I've heard this from a few people. You want to tell me <clears throat> that this person is going to live the life and enjoy himself or enjoy herself and party and get with women and men and travel, and drink, and do whatever they want, and act however they want, and then eventually they're going to go to heaven over my dead body. They must be going to hell, because they are enjoying this life. And if they're going to enjoy this life, they must suffer in the next life. This is the, the reasoning that they go through. Then you ask them, okay, can you show me a proof, a holistic proof from the Quran? How did you come up to that conclusion? That doesn't have to do with your feelings about that person. One example that comes to mind is Paul Walker. The guy that, uh, he's an actor from the Fast and the Furious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He died in this car crash. And people got moved and emotional. And yet, I mean, if you look at the Facebook reactions, I find Facebook as an interesting sociological kind of <laughs> tracking yeah. of Muslim behavior. And uh, you look at a lot of Muslims that just felt bad because they, and why did they feel bad for him? And they wanted him to go to heaven. Because Paul Walker had an effect on their lives in one way or another. Whether they, he made them feel good, they, he entertained them in some way, he made them laugh, he, they connected with him through the screen, through his characters, uh, through his charity work, something. And so they just feel like he's a good person and they identify with him. And so they feel this thing in their hearts that they don't want him to suffer. On the other hand, you have all these other Muslims who just, they don't care. He's going to hell no matter what because he's not a Muslim. Nothing will avail him. You know, all that type of language. And when you look at what he said, I mean, I, I read one of his interviews where he said, I don't understand atheists. This is one of his interviews. I don't understand atheists. I look, I'm a, I'm a person of nature. I like surfing. And when I go out to the ocean and I see nature, I just wonder, like, how can there not be a God? You know, when he reflects on the beauty of everything. So he was a deist at the least. But then he says, and I'm a Christian. I identify myself as a Christian. So he was a Christian, he says. So, okay, we'll take him at face value. But at least he was a deist. He believed in God. And even if he didn't, even if he's never heard anything, you want to tell me that someone out of their ignorance, and, and the analogy that you'll always hear is, you mean to tell me you can break the law and, uh, and then pretend that by breaking the law uh, that you, you know, and, and you didn't know the law that you shouldn't be punished? Yeah, well, that's the criteria that God has stated. Don't do it while you know. It's not your, it's not your criteria. So, I don't know. I just, I feel like for a lot of people, they, they, they measure it based on their experience of religion. The way I look at Islam, I enjoy Islam. I really enjoy it. I, when I look at other people that are not Muslim, I don't feel like, oh, they should go to hell because they're not Muslim. I just feel like, man, you're missing out. This religion is amazing. You really, like, I wish you could experience what I'm experiencing. But if they happen to pass away, I just go like, you know what? Allah knows best where they're going to end up. And he made the criteria that, 
We were not going to punish until we send a messenger. This is the criteria of God, not my criteria. This is not my call here. So, and Allah says, Jannatun arduha samawat wal ard. You know, nakaraha. This is again an issue of Arabic. He doesn't call jann- al jannah allati arduha. He says, Jannatun. Just nakira. Yani it's one of the paradises, one of the heavens. It's vast as the universe. The universe is about 28 billion light years across. Okay, that's the size of the universe that we are aware of. 28 billion light years across it. Okay? You want to tell me that this vast universe is only uh, having sufficient room for you and your crew and your people and nobody else is allowed? I mean, I just... It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. And then Imam al-Ghazali, Imam Muhammad al-Ghazali, and he said, he, he wrote in his book, Faisal al-Tafriqa, he said that non-Muslims are divided into three types. One type that has never heard anything. Think of like native tribes in the Amazon. Nobody's ever reached them. They're like excluded from anything. And, and they just do, they're just on fitra. You know, whatever they believe, they believe. And that's it. He says those people cannot be taken into account because Allah says he wasn't going to punish the people until they get a messenger. The second group are people عانadu. You know, like you have Abu Jahl that sees the messenger وسلم, and readily admits, you know, Abu Jahl in a famous story, he was asked, يعني, did, uh, is there anything wrong with what he's saying? And Abu Jahl said, no. Have you guys tried him lying? No, 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 no. Okay, so what's the issue? Why do you not want to believe in the messenger? He said, well, before he came up with this, his family and our family, like both tribes, we used to compete against one another in honor. You know, who would does the most charity? Who would do the best thing? Who would like we used to compete politically against each other? And then this guy comes yeah. now and he says he's a messenger. We can't beat that. <laughs> so we're gonna like he's getting a message from God. We can't beat that. So we just de- reject it. So to him, it wasn't about truth. It was about ego, honor, whatever it is. Al kufr, you know, kufr. In Islam, in Arabic, cover is to cover over that you know something is true and then you reject it. There's actually a, a, a study that none other than Sam Harris, one of the four horsemen of new atheism, who did a little bit of cognitive neuroscience to get his PhD in neuroscience. He has a paper that was published on the neuroscience of belief. And in the paper, he looks at the brain activation for people that believe and people that, and that disbelief. And he saw that the brain area that gets activated for belief gets activated first, okay, and faster in both people. People that say they don't believe and people that believe, they get the same brain brain area activation. People that say they disbelieve, they have a secondary activation in another location in the brain that comes after that gets them to reject. So they actually have to, they first start from a place of acknowledgement, that yes, there is a God, and then they dis- disbelief afterwards. They cover it over. They cover over the truth. So Christians, Jews, You know, like the Quran is, again, it goes back to just how we perceive God. This goes to an issue of aqidah. How, you know, in uh, the Arab world, especially in the Arab world, but in the Muslim world, uh, God is angry all the time and he's just waiting to just destroy all of us this is the understanding that a lot of Muslims have and so you know for us to be saved to be arrogant enough to say like oh yeah we're going to heaven for sure and then everybody else is going to hell because they assume that that is the default position of God that God is about punishment not about mercy and, uh, and when you look at the hadith al-Qudsi سَبَقَتْ رَحْمَتِي غَلَبَتْ رَحْمَتِي عَذَابِي or سَبَقَتْ رَحْمَتِي عَذَابِي غَضَبِي that my mercy supersedes, always supersedes my wrath, my anger and the whole creation فَاضَ مِنْ عَيْنِ الرَّحْمَةِ like this is stuff in our tradition we, nobody hears about it nobody wants to hear about it nobody wants to talk about it and it's because they just want to feel good about themselves I don't identify and you know what when you seek def- uh, to define yourself based on negating the other, you know, we are not them, you also negate yourself at the same time because they are not you either. You know, you are not them 
and they are not you. You're negating everybody. And so you end up with complete negation of everything. I don't seek an Islam, as far as I understand it, does not promote that type of vision. It promotes a positive assertion of who you are, not who you're not. And when you talk about who you are, you will start to have a, a, a cognitive paradigm shift in how you see how, who everyone else is. But yeah, it's just, uh, you know, it's, to say all these things, I think first reflect on your own self and, and your own relationship with Islam before you speak with, about where everybody else is going to go because they're not Muslim. Um, I, I, the only thing I could just say is I just wish we would become proactive and we really start, you know, we should not be giving the platform to people that will enforce more sectarianism amongst us and people that speak in the language of hate. A language that is definitely not prophetic in any sense of the word. Um, we also need to stop obsessing over minor issues and minor details. And I believe that our biggest problem as a Muslim community is the lack of distinction between matters of theology and matters of jurisprudence. The lack of distinction between matters that are essential to belief and matters that are ancillary to belief. And the way that we envision Islam itself as in one group, me and my crew, and everybody else is against us, as opposed to a proper envisioning of it as Islam being an umbrella term um, that encompasses a lot of things. Look at, um, and, and this is, this is uh, the final point I want to say about this is, you know, sometimes you'll get uh, Muslims that have doubts, okay, and they have issues. And... You will try to present them with one particular perspective of, you know, what you think proper Islam is like. And let's say that they are not convinced by it. For whatever reason, they have a different inclination intellectually. You know, Islam has different explanations and interpretations that don't touch on the core essential beliefs, but they just speak about how they're elaborated. If you take those elaborations to be essential parts of creed, you end up excluding a lot of people who may think in a different way. To make this example more concrete, there are certain matters where, say, the Mu'tazila um, differed with Ahl sunnah on. And the Mu'tazila is really the creedal form that influences a lot of what the Ibadis, modern-day Ibadis and modern-day Shi'is uh, take up with Islam and their understanding of Islam. If you're faced with a Muslim who's having doubts because of the way that say some Sunni scholars have explained certain things and you can save that person you know they can remain a Muslim if they just could just go with the Mu'tazili way I personally find it problematic that we prefer to get them out of Islam than to leave them within Islam as a Mu'tazili do you see what I'm saying like I, I just I think that we are more interested in our own affirmation of being the absolute truth than we are in encompassing as many people as possible. And we really need to take a lesson from Hadith al-Shafa'ah. You know, the Shafa'ah of the Prophet ﷺ, the intercession of the Prophet ﷺ, where he says, Man kana fi qalbihi, you know, he, he asks Allah, he goes back and forth to get people out of hell on the Day of Judgment. And he asks Allah, إِذَنْ لِي Allah فِي مَنْ كَانَ فِي قَلْبِهِ مَنْ قَالَ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Eventually, you know, مَنْ كَانَ فِي قَلْبِهِ مِثْقَالُ ذَرَّةٍ مِثْقَالُ حَبَّةٍ مِنْ خَرْدَلٍ مِثْقَالُ حَبَّةٍ مِنْ شَعِيرٍ You know, he goes down in size of how much faith they have to have in their heart to get them out of hell. And then eventually, the Prophet says, إِذَنْ لِي Allah فِي مَنْ قَالَ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ and Allah at the end of that hadith, He says, وَعِزَّتِي وَجَلَالِي لَأُخْرِجَنَّ مِنْهَا مَنْ قَالَ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ You know, and then He says, and in another hadith, مَنْ قَالَ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهَ دَخَلَ الْجَنَّةِ So when you really boil things down to what the essential thing that will save everybody, it's قَوْلُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ 
it's not going to be your scholarly elaborations and academic endeavors about what is Islamic and what is un-Islamic based on your understanding of what the Quran is saying. And we have to adopt a different language when it comes to this, especially when we're speaking with a mass number of people who are different in their intellectual aptitude than the previous generations. You know, who can read and write and access information and, and think for themselves. And we have to respect that faculty. Because at the end of the day, when you come to, the, to Allah on the Day of Judgment, Allah tells you what's going to avail, who's not going to avail you, and it's everyone is not going to avail you. That on a day where no wealth or children will benefit except the one who comes to Allah with a sound heart, you are in a better position for exercising your intellect and trying to get closer to Allah through how you understand these things than you trying to say and blame someone else. Because on the Day of Judgment, if you come and say, Oh Allah, Sheikh Fulan said, Allah will just come back to you and say, but I gave you an intellect. Didn't I give you an intellect to think about? Now if the Sheikh tries to misguide you by telling you only one way of doing things, and he, you know, he prevents you, he doesn't even give you the, the, the fairness, the fair treatment of just giving you all the information. Yeah, that Sheikh is sinning, he's got a problem. But now in this day and age, we have ability to connect with each other in massive numbers of ways that are unprecedented. A lot of Muslims that leave Islam, as far as I can tell, um, a lot of them are doing it in a hasty way. They're not spending the time to investigate, to ask, to look around, to see what's driving them, how they're coming up to that conclusion at the end of the day. And a lot of the Muslims that are driving them away are more interested in asserting their version of Islam as opposed to asserting Islam itself and what Islam is saying and what the Messenger Wasallam said. So that's that's what I have to say about that. Yeah. Well, it was very nice talking to you. Barakallahu feekum. Yeah, I really, I really invested a lot. And thank you so much for helping me out with the film. So uh, um, I, I really don't know how to thank you. No, I, I thanks, for, no thanks for not thanks for the opportunity. Um, I'm looking forward oh, to it coming out. I want to see what you end up doing.